Good morning. Uh, hard act to follow Ganesh after he's spoken about behavior, right? And I think after last night's party, you'll need no <laughs> advice on behavior. But I want to tell you that my talk is going to be about behaviors. But behaviors of whom? Behaviors of the FIIs, right? So I'm going to focus on this because, and I'll show you why I feel that this is the most important thing that's going to generate wealth for our investors, okay? And the reason for that is that if you look at the answer, it lies in the ownership of the stock market and who is actually buying and selling in it, right? So on the left hand side, this pie chart tells you the ownership of the stock market, right? And you look at it and say, what's the big deal? Foreign institutional investors are only 19% of our stock market. The devil lies in the detail. Because 42% is owned by the private promoters of the companies. Now promoters don't sell their stock unless they come up with a follow-on public offering, right? Or they'll go and pledge their share if they want to raise money. So they are not trading in the market. They are not creating wealth. They are there to create wealth for themselves, right? So this, if you take out, is what is called as a free float of the market, where the other players come in. So what I've done here in this table is to show you the breakup of the free float shares. And now you will see there that 33% of our free float is in the hands of FIIs, right? And since ultimately there are individual investors behind FIIs, you will see the nature of that. Ultimately, the decision makers are a few hundreds. Whereas in every other space, right? Yes, domestic mutual funds, the decision maker is around hundreds because you have 44 AMCs with five fund managers each. But all of the rest are spread over a large number of people. So they don't have the ability to decide the fate of the market. Yes, mutual funds do carry that right. But ultimately, a fund manager in India cannot decide whether to buy or not to buy. Because if your investors give you money and you give it to the fund manager, he has to buy. He can keep 5% in cash. He can make a decision on what to buy, but he cannot make a decision on whether to buy. So ultimately, we all know that over a period of time, domestic investors since April 2021 have been investing continuously. They have been net buyers, right? So this FIA is the one which decides the fate of our stock market because they are the jump ones. They are the big big elephant in the room. So understanding their behavior is critical. Why? Because of all the markets in the world, I said, no, India is the center of gravity. Of all the markets in the world, India is the fourth most sensitive to FII flows in the world. So not only is it important for us, it's important for the world because it's the fourth most market that gets impacted by an FII. So the FII as a, as a, as a, entity is absolutely critical from our country's perspective. Now, who is this FII we talk about? Right? There's about $680 billion of ownership of Indian equities, and this gives you the breakup. Right? Now, I've clearly split this pie chart into two. Right? Why? I'd like to talk about this as long-term money, and this as hot money or short-term money. Right? And as you can see, a quarter of this is long-term money. So long-term wealth creation for our investors is at the hands of these people. And in the short term, what happens in the market is in the hands of these people, right? Now, just a little bit of explanation here. Most of my talk is going about the long term because we want to create wealth in the medium term. But these people play an important part. And within this, though I have shown mutual funds and hedge funds, we all know that there are two types of mutual funds. Ganesh spoke about it. There are passive mutual funds and active mutual funds. Right? Now, when I call them as hot money, they are not all super hot. Some are warm, some are hot. What do I mean? Is that behind the passive mutual funds are hundreds and thousands of investors all over the world. So their behavior is not every day coming up and changing their minds. Second, active mutual funds, just like Indian mutual funds, will take a three to five year view. So in that, if they change their view on India, your allocation will change. But hedge funds are the ones which take as short as one day to 18 months call on investing in a market or out. 
So the short term volatility in the market is largely created by hedge funds. Today my focus is not on that, okay, on what they are doing. But the longer term money, how is that going to behave? That's where I want to focus today on. And there if you see the long term money, right, is linked to the share of the global GDP of a country. So from our point of view, if we want more long term money to come to a market, then it is how India grows relative to the world growth. Right? So why I'm saying this is that we talk about 6% growth. 6% growth is not fantastic growth. The reason it looks great is because the world is growing at 3% if you include emerging countries, otherwise it's growing at 1% to 2%. So it's the relative growth of our country that is important. Right? So from that point of view, right, I want to tell you that this you saw here that it went from 12 to 16, right? What has done to our market? See, the other thing that we have to think about is that these long-term FIIs are giving stability to our returns. So there's one thing is actually delivering return. Second is to actually manage the investor, right? The more you have ups and downs, the more difficult it is to manage your investor, right? So the greater the component goes up, it's in our interest that we will provide a much more stable long-term growth path, right? So from that point of view, just focus here on the green line. In 2000, FII average holding in India was 16 months. Today, FII average holding in India is 35 months. Does it mean every FII has increased this holding period? No. The component of long-term money coming into a market has gone up. The 10, 15 year money that has made. And that's why if you see later, I'll show you a slide. Indian market's volatility is much less than a world market's volatility, right? And that volatility is important from another perspective, which I will come to, right? So now what is the outlook for this long term growth capital, the flows, right? It depends on India's medium term growth potential. Now, where does this come from? As I said, the world's center of gravity is shifting to India, right? What do I mean by that? It essentially starts with the India-China story. Because if you see the population today, China plus India accounts for a third of the population of the world. And what China achieved over the last decades is what we are looking to achieve. So today we have just overtaken China in terms of its population. But do you know the difference in the GDP between India and China? China is almost six times of India's GDP. We have the same population or better, but we are one-sixth in terms of GDP. So that gives you the potential that lies in front of us. And if we are today where China was in 2007, it is not just in terms of GDP, but even per capita GDP, private consumption, investment, exports, all of it, we are where China was in 2007, right? So what we think is that over the period of 2007 to 2031, we'll reach where they reached in 2007 to 11. So what they took four years, we'll take nine years to do, but we will do it, right? And so from that point of view, if you see, India over the period of the decades has always grown at this 6%, except for that period post-COVID, we've always been at a 6% growth. So why I'm saying this is we are the fastest growing, like I said, because the world is slowing down. Our growth rate hasn't gone anywhere. We are still growing at that 6%. And can we now grow at 10%? That's the challenge. And so to show you the potential, we have just redrawn the India map. And just to show you that the entire United States population is Uttar Pradesh. Right? And if you look at the growth rate for Uttar Pradesh, right? I've taken one metric here, which is the cement growth. So you, can you see how... Uttar Pradesh is overtaking India in terms of cement demand growth, right? So that's the potential I want to show. If the whole of India can follow this, we can, sky is the limit, right? And the reason this is coming to our advantage is because China's population has started decreasing, whereas we have got 20 more years before we worry about a decline in our population, right? And if you see, obviously, we are one of the youngest populations in the world. We are also adding 22% of the world's working age population by 2030. Means one out of every five laborers is in India, right? So as a result of this, if you see our failure of the past and the potential for the future, the yellow dot there tells you the share of the working age population, right? So obviously we are close to China. But if you see the share of exports of China, it's two percentage points more than their share of 
the population, whereas we are way, way below. So clearly, the growth story of India has to come from manufacturing as the first leg. This manufacturing leg, for that, if you see, we have already started making progress in a lot of areas. So from 2014 to 22, if you see in all of these, we have made huge strides. In further, there are much more detailed ones which tell you about the whole infra development plan because manufacturing share is low and this is changing because of these factors, right? So the government, post the NDA regime starting, has done a huge amount of effort, including the PLI scheme, right? And if you look at this, our share of manufacturing in the world is among the lowest as a percentage of GDP. Where we need to get is to get to China, which is 27, South Korea, which is 28. Right? And what is the reforms? The main reform is ease of doing business because Indian manufacturers to step up to world standards is going to be taking a long time. We need foreign manufacturers to come to India and set up shop to take advantage of that labor and of our cost. Because if you now see, already the PLI scheme success is visible in the smartphone. China's share has dropped from 72 to 64. The gainer there is India from 9 to 15, right? So the journey has started. And if you look at the infra work the government is doing, it's phenomenal. From right from national highways to broadband to renewable electricity to railway loot electrification. And why this focus on infrastructure? Because it is the job creation potential of infrastructure. It's called employment elasticity. For every one rupee that you spend, how many jobs do you create? So as you can see there, construction and utilities are the ones that are the enormous uh, employment elasticity. And the largest number of engineers in the world are already being produced by India, right? And this talent pool comes at a very, very reasonable cost. Because if you look at the manufacturing labor cost per hour, India is at 1.6 along with Vietnam. China is at 4.2. So we already have a huge 1.6 divided by 4.2. We are at 40% of China's cost. So you have a 60% cost advantage compared to, and who do we want to supply to? We want to supply to the US, which has a 30, right? So that's the potential from this. This manufacturing and the job creation, which is going to take place over the next decade, is going to lead to the second sector which is going to drive India's growth, which is consumption. Why? Because we are going to have the largest middle class for many years to come. We have already overtaken China, right? And second, we are at $2,300 per capita today. By the end of the decade, we will double that per capita. What is going to do with this extra money that people get? So one point here is that if you look at Asian economies, when they hit $2,000, their economies exploded. So that's China here in terms of per capita and China in terms of car penetration. So from 16 cars, it went to 115 cars, right? You take another country here, South Korea, when they crossed 2,000, the per capita GDP exploded, but along with this, consumption, motorcycle, motor vehicles penetration exploded, right? So this doubling of per capita, Indonesia saw the same in terms of per capita income and in terms of this. So taking on these examples, right, you look at the potential for India now. Only 50% of our households own a two-wheeler. Only 17% own a car. The dark blue are the high car ownership and the gray and the yellow are the low car ownership, right? So you can see from the colors which states go. Similarly, only 20% own ACs or coolers, and only 40% own a refrigerator, right? If you see, again, in cars and consumer durables, if you see India, China, US, it's a huge gulf for us to cross. And if you take cars in use per thousand, right? Where is India? Even Japan, South Korea, United States are all way, way up. So this manufacturing-driven employment generation is going to lead to the discretionary consumption boom, right, for our country. And the biggest advantage here is while we have the lowest urban population, our rate of growth of urban population is the highest. As you know, when people move into cities is when they desire all of these durables and stuff like that, right? So this shift also means that if you see the percentage of income that is spent on basic necessities, if you take elite affluent aspirers, right, from 33% of the total population, they are going to go to 50% of the population. 
So population moving from the strugglers and the lower middle class up is what is essentially driving this story. And if you see the aggregate consumption spent, right, the same graph, I've put it here, that from where we are now spending 21,000 rupees per capita on discretionary, we are going to go to 66,000 rupees. So three times the spending on the discretionary consumption is going to shoot up, right? So uh, that's what, so essentially it's growth plus urbanization plus consumption is the huge retail market opportunity. So this then brings into the play that FDI which comes in will not only look at exporting to their home country, but to selling into the domestic market. You know Apple's story, right? They started selling the Apple phone five, five year and started exporting 10, today they are going to make 15 itself in India. So India for them is not only a low labor cost, plentiful labor supply, but also a huge market for the foreigners, right? The third element of which is going to benefit is the services segment, right? So in the services segment, if you see, these are the huge changes that have happened over the last few years. All of you are aware of these, right? And hence, if you see, in data volume, we have just exploded. We are the highest globally in data volume today. We are also digitization, we are refrogging. What India achieved in financial inclusion in nine years would have taken 47 years in the normal course of time, right? And if you see the data's penetration and the cost of penetration, cost of one GB data, we are the data pricing, we are the lowest in the world. So we are going through this huge digital transformation in a world which is going digital. We are miles ahead of the world in terms of that. So the impact of this will be seen in the overall penetration of services in our economy, right? And UPI payments, can you believe? Just pre-COVID to now, it's 10 times up. It's not a percentage rate of growth, right? Just a matter of three years, right? So as a result of this, if you see already this Digitalization, everything is coming to our benefit because non-software outsourced services, which is essentially based on data and how you manipulate data is shooting up, right? So from that point of view, to summarize, manufacturing services, private consumption, these three put together, our economy is going to go tripling in a 15 year time frame. So that's why I said when I say India is the center of gravity, right? We are going to probably grow at least at a 12% CAGR, 6% GDP plus at least, right? Definitely we should expect our uh, growth rate to hit 8 or 10%, but maybe inflation will moderate a bit. So safely taking 12% is a uh, reasonable thing. So these, to summarize, are the key drivers for India in the medium term, which are going to drive our economy. And moving from this economy stuff, to the implication for FIF flows, which is where I want to come to. Because if you now look at it, right, if you take the passive segment, right, what's happening there? Now in passive, what happens? You have an emerging market index. So the first thing is people should get more money into passives worldwide, into equities, but our share of the passives has to grow. And how is that grows? They look at, like in a stock, inclusion in the stock in the index, they look at the growth potential of the stock. So India's growth potential is reflected in our share of the passives and which is a very telling statement. Today we are 14.8% of the emerging market index. Where were we two years ago? At 8%, from 8 to 12, 12 to 15. So India's growth potential is getting reflected in terms of the passive. So every 100 rupees that comes into an emerging market fund, 15 rupees comes to India, whereas only 8 used to come three years ago. And this, in fact, if you take over a longer term, you'll realize how for years we were stuck at the same level. And now after COVID, we have just taken off. So another way to correlate it to our growth is this. And this is not just about the index share going up. The actual passive flows into India post that. See, it's 5.6 billion, wherein 21 non-ETF flows were only half a billion into India. In calendar 22, if normal FIIs were pulling out money for various reasons, including high oil prices, but still passives brought in three and a half billion. And year to date, passives has brought in double the money of actives already into India. So one of the things is India's growth goes up, we can expect a share of the emerging market index to go up, and along with that, the flows to keep going and sustaining our valuations, right? That's number one. Let's move to active MF flows, right? 
When you look at active MF flows, how do they take a call? They take a three to five view, and for them, because 35% of India's large cap index is the banking sector. This is absolutely critical, and we are today talking about the health of the banking system at the NPS at the lowest in a decade. So this is one of the things we just made, a healthy and robust for which we must thank Reserve Bank as well as the way the banks have managed it is, is fantastic. The second aspect is the corporates, because we talked about the CapEx cycle, corporates will have to borrow money from the banks. Today, over the last few years, they have reduced their, this is non-bank corporate debt, that is corporates who are not banks borrowing from the market have brought down tremendously from 75% to 52%. What does this tell you? It means all these corporates have that much room to borrow to expand. So it gives a phenomenal story for the financing of the infrastructure. And if you see here, just one, CLSA has increased India portfolio like 20% above the MSCI benchmark. MSCI benchmark was 14.8. So 20% above, that means they are allocating 18% to India. Similarly, if you see overall market, there are only two countries which are hugely overweight in terms of active fund managers outside India. Japan at 55% overweight, India at 28% overweight. So the medium term growth story up to three to five years is already getting discounted by this allocation of active fund managers. So we saw passives, we saw active MFs. Now let's look at the longer term sovereign wealth funds. Just to remind you of that, pension and insurance funds, how do they link it? They link it to size of share of the global GDP. So when you now look at relative GDP growth, already you know for this year and next year, India is the fastest growing country in the world. At 5.9, 6.3 versus 2.8 and 3 for the world, right? And if you see project for 2025, we continue because we expect our growth to hit to 7, whereas the world growth, global growth will go to 3.3. So up to 25 also, it's looking great. But if you then look at it over 27, the journey of India, today we are at what? We are at the fifth largest country in the world. By 2027, we will be the third largest country in the world. So this relative growth is what is important, right? And from that point of view, right, if you now take a look at what is India's GDP as a share of global GDP. Right? So from the 2.4 to 3 is where you saw the FIA long term money go from 12 to 16. So from this 3, we will hit 4 by 2027. So you can expect sovereign wealth fund share to keep going up, 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 up. How much is it today? Do anybody remember? Do you remember the sovereign wealth fund share? It's 16%. So when I say this will grow up, Right? You'll say, will 16 go to 18 or 20? But not necessarily. Why? Because sovereign wealth funds go up, other funds also go up. Right? So from that point of view, let's also look at the fact that when you look at it from an FIA perspective, right? First is what? That Tina factor. Now Tina is not Anil Ammani's wife. It is, there is no alternative to investing in India. So when I said India is the center of gravity, right? If you look at the growth rate over the next four year period, on an average basis, we are way above, Indonesia is close to us, then comes China, right? So for a foreign long term investor, there is no alternative but to look at India. And the other aspect, right? Any investor wants less of uncertainty, less of downside risk. Right? So you now assess that how much India's economy dropped during COVID, how much it dropped during the global financial crisis, and look at it, the downside risk to India's GDP growth is the second lowest in the world after Indonesia. So as an as a investor, you don't look only at growth, you also look at the variability of returns, which is what is called as risk, the standard deviation in our parlance. Right? So India is not only the fastest growing, we are also the least risk of downtrend in our growth, which is very important from an FI perspective. As a result, this is a very important slide to think about. What? Is that India, because our beta to the MSCI index is coming down, which means what? We are becoming a defensive stock in an FII's portfolio. Right? Now, many people read this defensive say, oh, what's it's negative. No. If you look at the valuation of Nestle versus valuation of LNT, Nestle trades at 60 PE, LNT trades at 20 PE. Arguably, LNT is a higher growth company than Nestle. 
Why the higher PE is given? Because what the market wants is the certainty of that growth. That people will drink Nescafe regardless of whether rain or sunshine, whether downtrend or uptrend, right? It's that certainty of growth, so always defensive. Because remember, foreign FII, India is a stock. So there are stocks in our portfolio at high PE, there are stocks in our portfolio at low PE. The high PE stocks are what? Right? HDFC banks of the world, the IT companies when they were doing well, and the FMCG stocks, right? So India's move to a defensive stock means that we will continue to get a high premium and we'll continue to get consistent flows, right? So remember that this, this movement of India away from cyclicality to a more defensive is one of the fundamental changes of India. Right? And now when you look at the outlook for the equity market because of this, we also have to bring in the domestic flow perspective. Why? Because it's not only FIIs, right? Domestic flows are also supporting when FIIs are selling, right? We are well aware of that. So we need to know that from a medium term perspective, how's the story for domestic flows going to be? And there when you look at it, right? Look at the domestic capital flows, the key chart is here that in this last seven years, when the share of household savings has shifted decisively from physical to financial. In 2014, 55% of a person's assets were in physical in a house, 45% was in financial. Today that ratio has reversed. It's become 60, 40. In that period, yes, mutual funds have grown at 23% per annum CAGR. But the sad part is that we are only 2% of the financial assets of the country. Why I point this out is, yes, we are growing very fast, but we have a long way to grow to eat into the share of the rest of the financial assets. One, number one. What is going to happen to this savings basket? There when you see, first of all, that India's penetration of mutual funds is among the lowest among the reasonable markets in the world. 12 Overall, five equity compared to 120 and 75 for the US, right? That's point number two. Point number three here is the penetration of equities itself as an asset class, barring Maharashtra and Gujarat. Maharashtra because of Bombay and Gujarat, of course, is Gujarat, right? You are seeing that everywhere is a single digit presentation of equities. Forget about mutual funds in that. And from that point of view, what I want to draw your attention is back to this chart that our per capita income is going to double. So when our per capita income doubles, right, you know what happened the previous time per capita income doubled, that is from 1100 to 2300, bank deposits grew three times. That means when per capita income, why? Because a person can't eat more than one kilo of rice a day. <laughs> person can't buy more than five houses. <laughs> He cannot buy more than he can air condition his bathroom, but beyond that he can't air condition his lawn. So there is a limit to consumption. Your consumption will go up, but when your income goes up, your savings also goes up. It went up three times in the previous time. I believe it will now go up four times. Why? Because this is what Ganesh pointed out in his presentation, the dependency ratio. If you paid attention to Ganesh, you'll realize what he said was that, in same thing, he put it in bars and put it this way. It means the number of people who are dependent on the earners in the society. Between 20 to 60, if you take as people who are earning, the people below 20 and above 60 are dependent on these people. And he correlated it to GDP growth. But I'm looking at it from a savings potential that if less people are dependent on India's income earners, then they have less to spend. And they have more to save, right? So I believe that in the next decade, when we go doubling our per capita GDP, Savings potential, which I showed from the bank there, is going to grow up not three times, but four times. Now the issue is what? The issue is that, where is this money gone? So you see the Jandan Aadhaar mobile, which the government introduced, right? The direct benefit transfers has brought down our extreme poverty level people from 124 million to 15 billion. So which means your addressable universe of people who can give you a thousand rupee SIP has gone up tremendously, right at the bottom of the period. Second thing is what? Because of DBT, all these people, because of Jandan, are forced to open bank accounts. So for you from a KYC, accessing that person from the informal economy, he has moved to the formal economy. That's why I believe that this time it's going to be 4x. Because, and we are already winning this battle against bank deposits. 
from 2010 when we were 13.7 percent of bank deposits we are today already 22 percent so not only is the savings basket going to increase our mutual funds is going to increase its share of the pie within the financial market and that's going to provide the buying support for our market right so now when you look at the equity market outlook taking all of that that i've said just think about it first of all is that india the growth of large mid and small depends on where we are in the economic cycle right so when you take the bad cycles which is 2008 to 13 or 17 to 20 you lost money in large caps also but you lost much more in mid caps and much more in small caps but then the economy is positioned on a virtuous cycle large caps made you money but mid caps made you much more and small caps made you much more so you can see in every cycle this has been true including the recent cycle up to september 30th is the data so the point is that for us to see whether we put more money into large caps or into broader market depends on where we are in the economic cycle and there if you see from the covid bottom india has just reached the early part of the up cycle so we are long 7 to 10 year journey in terms of our economic cycle so if you stay through that cycle it is means that you got to have a broad market allocation across the cap curve right so from that point of view the good part and maybe we should all clap for ourselves here is that today small cap mutual fund folios have overtaken mid cap and large cap now in the short run that might be high risk because you are seeing volatility but in a medium term we are at the right moment and if you actually look at the numbers here it was just 50 lakh folios now it's 1.3 crore now if you emotionally manage your customer over the next few months when there will be volatility over the cycle of the business cycle that's the number of people are going to be very happy because in a business cycle small caps are going to return better returns than mid caps or large caps so we have done it right but you got to hang in there and there again what is the thing confidence coming from the confidence is coming because we have increased it via sip book which means these flows and most sips today are perennial sips right you will put them on till 2030 2099 right so these flows are the ones which are going to help the market because they are going to consistently give the fund managers money and this is only going to go up for all the reasons that we spoke but the beauty of this is that already the impact of the si book the same slide i am now showing now i am asking you to focus on the red line which is domestic investors from 16 months average holding we have already pushed them almost to 45 months so already our investors are staying for that much longer which gives stability to our market right that's also important and now when you look at the break up of the sip book now this is not the entire industry of taking it only for 14000 funded though it's 16000 because there's some data sips and others who don't report into camps uh, mf desk and all that but already what are you seeing there the largest sip book of the industry is already in small cap and next followed by mid cap so if you see mid and small accounts for 30% of the sip book and then when you take the multi cap category which is large and mid cap multi cap focused and uh, your uh, you know uh, flexi cap they are another 30% what i'm saying is 60% of the domestic flows through sip are already coming into broader market so when returns are done you know when i talked about these returns right these returns come from where these returns come from actual superior eps growth of the mid cap and small cap companies but also more money chasing those stocks as you know returns come from actual economic growth translating to eps and the price you are willing to pay for that stock as a commodity because of the flow pattern shifting you will see this becomes a self fulfilling prophecy you will automatically see only thing is you got to be patient to wait over that cycle you will see that your small cap funds will deliver a much better return and the future will be better because this wasn't the case in the past it's only now in this phase that we have shifted decisively the domestic investor portfolio into small and mid cap so that's going to be the thing which is going to help our long term growth story in a tremendous way and so obviously you keep domestic orientation because india is a center of gravity you keep a broad cap oriented portfolio right and let's look at the valuations part because frequently you get noise about valuations so first thing i want to show you is that india has been at a premium 
to the world market blue and to the emerging market gray right from 2006 onwards. So 17 years we are overvalued. <laughs> right? How will we like that? If we are consistently overvalued, somebody should sell us. It goes back to that defensive stock story. Because of our consistent growth, even at a premium, people are willing to buy us even then. Right? Second, if you see 10 year average, versus emerging market, versus Asia Pacific, versus the world. We've always been at a premium, right? And the reason for this, you saw that 33% of free float in the very first slide. This 33% from 2006 is 35 to 45. So FIIs have been owning 35% at least of our stock market for 17 years. For donkey's years they are owning. So if India was an overvalued market, you think this will take place? No. And why is that gone to 33? Because domestic flows have stepped up, so the ratio has changed a little bit. But otherwise, they have been always the largest owner. So this consistent ownership by FIIs, right? And here you can see that year-on-year -year flows, except for 2018 when we went through a slowdown, and last year where we saw the impact of oil prices on our flows, every year we've been a recipient of flows. And so the key thing to look at is, if we have always been at a premium to the rest of the world, how are we respect to our own history? And there if you see, yes, we go through periods of undervaluation or overvaluation. Today we are at a reasonable valuation. So first thing first, remember today we are at reasonable valuation. Now what you got to look at from here is the journey there or journey here. Right? That's all you need to look at, right? And for the journey there versus here is what I took on the last half not talking about. Right? That India is going to deserve a premium over the world. And so, I want to point out here that people keep questioning lifetime highs a correction, lifetime highs a correction. This is an analysis of all the lifetime highs over the last two decades. Right? And it's important that you take this with you. Because the returns, when you invest at a lifetime high, is the risk greater, is the reward lesser? Right? I want to tell you the reward is the same. Whether you stayed one year after a lifetime high or five years after a lifetime high, two-thirds of the time you made inflation beating returns. Okay? In fact, the percentage comes down here because consistently to maintain five years all the time, 15% plus is hard for the market. But the point I want to stress is this. In one year, if you got out after the lifetime high, there was a 28% chance of your losing your capital. But when you stay for five years, that's only a 7% chance. So the idea is that Indian market, even at lifetime high, can deliver excellent returns even after one year also. Probabilities are there. But the issue is why long term? Because the downside risk dramatically comes down as you stretch it. So don't worry about lifetime high. Second, when you talk about lifetime high, these are levels of the market, right? They are not necessarily lifetime high in terms of valuations. Why do I say that? Because we've just been through this period, right? This correction, this was a lifetime high in market levels. But in valuation terms, it was not. Valuation terms, it was only in 2021 October. So, you know we are reasonable valuation, people go by Sensex levels and Nifty levels. No. They have no meaning. Because if earnings growth keeps up, your market can go up without the valuation going up. So the key point here is to stress that not to worry about lifetime highs of the market levels. Valuation levels you look at, but basically from a... The second thing about these lifetime highs is what? Why do markets reach these high valuations, high lifetime highs? Because market is always looking at the future. I've shown this slide to tell you that every year's GDP growth translating into EPS growth does not translate to stock market returns in that year. Right? For example, in the year 2020, you had a negative... EPS growth, but you had a 15% stock market return. But in the year, if you go to year 2018, you had 22% EPS growth for the market, but market was only up 3%. On a year-to-year -year basis, there's not a one-to-one -one match because market is looking future. So what is the answer then to this? Because you will have to answer this question that if there are corrections over the next three months due to various external factors, India's GDP growth is not suffering. Right? So from that point of view, to manage your investor, the point is that over the long run, the broader market cap of the economy always beats the nominal GDP growth. So this I've taken for China, I've taken for India and for South Korea. The table summarizes that, that 
every time when you have a longer term perspective the stock market always delivers better return than the nominal gdp growth of the country so what do you think i think nominal gdp growth 12% is conservative 6% gdp growth 6% inflation so the stock market should deliver and a broader market should deliver even better than that so thank you very very much for your